hope this is worth the wait for. <laughs> First off, I want to give a thank you to uh, Jim Gates, Bill Simons, and uh, all the organizi organizers and presenters here at the symposium. Uh, this is the second straight year in which I've had the privilege uh, to speak at the Baseball Hall of Fame, and obviously the honor is quite humbling. Um, also need to give a thank you to my parents, who are here in Cooperstown for the second straight year. Without their patience, support, love, and willingness to express their passion for one another, I simply would not be here with all of you. <laughs> <laughs> Last but not least, I need to give a thank you to Pat Costa, the creepy man grabbing that camera right there. Everyone in this room can probably think back to the moment when they first fell in love with baseball. For me, it was in the summer when I was about eight years old. Arms with a taped up wiffle ball bat, a tennis ball, fellow phone pole wires, a quiet city street and path, I discovered how beautiful it could be to spend all day keeping track of nothing but how many home runs we could hit and how many times we could hit the neighbors' houses or cars before they got upset. <laughs> Sir, thank you. That was also a lifelong friend and the first person to see and believe what you all hopefully will. No, not this presentation, but the image of Ted Williams in this painting. Don't see it? That's okay, give me a few minutes. <laughs> Jackson Pollock is arguably the most famous American painter in history. Best known for the pieces he created during his drip era, which began in 1947. Pollock's 1948 painting, Number Five, was sold at auction in 2006 for $140 million, the highest price ever for a single painting. More than anything Picasso ever created, more than any Van Gogh. More than any Renoir, Clement, de Kooning, Warhol, more than any painting by any painter ever. Pollock's life and legacy are well documented. Hundreds of books have been released about his art, including a 900 plus page biography, which resulted in the Pulitzer Prize for authors Stephen Nafe and Gregory White Smith in 1991. In 2000, actor Ed Harris starred in and directed Pollock, a biopic that earned him an Academy Award nomination and an Academy Award win for Marsha Gay Harden, who played Pollock's wife, Lee Krasner. Harris spent 10 years researching the role before production began on the film. There is clearly something fascinating about this long deceased painter who is most famous for not painting so clearly. And Nafe Smith and Harris are far from alone. Two years ago, scholar Henry Adams presented the very plausible idea that Pollock wrote his name in large letters on the canvas of his seminal 1943 painting mural. Don't see it? Pollock created the painting for the New York City home of the famous art collector Peggy Guggenheim, and a Paul Bunyan-esque tale was told about the picture's creation. The long-held story of mural is that Pollock completed it in a single night of fury and creativity after staring at a blank 8 by 20 foot canvas for months. Adams wrote, this story is so central to the Pollock mystique of an anguished, spontaneous genius. But the art critic Francis V. O'Connor has debunked the story saying Pollock probably executed mural during the summer of 1943, not in one night in late December. Adams's theory further solidifies O'Connor's claim. Adams says that we, what he sees are characters that are unorthodox, even ambiguous, and largely hidden. But it could be hardly random coincidence to find just those letters in that sequence. So the late art historian and former curator at the Museum of Modern Art, Kurt Vondo, Pollock has always been a source of debate. The man you see in the canvases is a richer and more complex person who's still alive in a certain sense in this art now, more so than the man who died in that car crash in 1956. Pollock's art is known for being mysterious, from the imagery we can decipher in it to the feeling we receive when we look at it, to the way it was created. The reasoning as to the way he chose to live his life is the same. What inspired him to be so unexplained with his work? Why, as such a successful artist, did he allow himself to be overtaken by alcohol at the end of it? For these questions, people far smarter than myself have offered their answers. <laughs> they have tires tirelessly dissected his artwork, his childhood upbringing in the West, his alcoholism, everything. Well, almost everything. Like many art historians, I have been infatuated with Pollock since I first discovered him. And so when it was time for me to do my senior thesis for my art history degree at the Art Institute of Boston, Naturally, I wanted to write about Pollock. But I wanted to explore a part of him that no one else had. As described before, there has been exhaustive research completed on the man, so the task I was taking up was extremely daunting. After about three consecutive round-the-clock weeks of book reading, film watching, and Google searching, I finally typed into the search engine, Jackson Pollock and baseball. 
I had finally reached the point of, what the hell? <laughs> there is, though, a rhyme and reason as to why I typed that in. A few years before, while skimming through the pages of an art history book prior to the arrival of a professor for a class, I took a look at a Pollock painting and organically saw an image of the Boston Red Sox great Ted Williams. To this day, I do not know where the trigger point inside my head came from. And man, I was sure of it. In the bottom left-hand corner of this mortgage board of paint, I saw a Teddy Ball game. The first person I showed the image to was my friend Pat. And then I showed it to a few other friends. They all came away thinking what I was thinking, or at least that's what they said. Let's put it this way. Their enthusiasm was not so strong that it kept me from spending three weeks meticulously looking through this artist's life before I finally typed Jackson Pollock in baseball into Google. What appeared on my computer screen, though, after that search is what has really led me here today. The first link the search engine brought up was to a Pollock biography written by Deborah Solomon. The author included an excerpt of a magazine interview with Betty Parsons in the 1967 May-June issue of Art in America. Parsons was an art dealer whose influence was so strong she has been referred to as the den mother of abstract expressionism, the art movement of which Pollock is considered a major figure. In the interview published 11 years after Pollock's death, Parsons revealed, quote, his most passionate interest after painting was baseball. He adored baseball and talked about it often. Much to my surprise, I had an official lead. Now, I'm not going to di go directly into my theory on the possibility that an homage to Ted Williams is located in Pollock's 1943 painting, Guardians of the Secret. For even after a few years of research, including a trip to San Francisco just to see the painting in person, the evidence that has been mounted thus far can still somewhat be considered a little Charlie Sheen-esque. <laughs> However, an organic thought from an excited wide-eyed college student and a quote discovered by a tired researcher who was nearly at wit's end has brought about considerable substantiation that baseball and other sports may have had a profound impact on Pollock's artwork. Maybe even images of the games secretly crept into some of his pieces. In 1950, German-born photographer Hans Nemeth offered his contribution to breaking down Pollock's myth as a purely non-objective painter late in his career, one who was devoid of conscious thought. With Pollock at the height of his fame, Namath filmed the artist at work. Less than 12 months before the recording took place, Time Magazine had asked the general public the question of Pollock, is he the greatest living painter in the United States? With that story came immediate celebrity for the 38-year-old Pollock. Namath's film aimed to show the world how this original artist was original. What he revealed is that Pollock often began the process of his so-called drip paintings, these paintings with neither seemingly intentional rhyme nor reason to them, with a comprehensible image, sometimes a wolf, sometimes a human figure. Wolves and human figures were regularly featured in Pollock's early work, even in the titles like Woman, 1934, Naked Man, 1938, and She-Wolf, 1943. Namath also discovered through his filming that Pollock was very athletic in his movements. As the artist circled the canvases that he placed on the ground, he moved rhythmically, much like the smooth way you would expect a trained baseball player or a tennis player to move, even a professional bowler. Said the art historian Barndo, the impression is the popular sense is that he just threw the paint all out. The Namath video shows how balletic and controlled the repetitive motions were, how very much a fine-tuned sense of athleticism went to the way the paint was laid down, the distance from the canvas, the speed that he worked at, the speed that he reflected at. These pictures are built organically out of a whole variety of willful decisions. That's what's very, very important to remember. That Pollock moved in such a way is by no coincidence and can be best explained by his childhood upbringing. Pollock was the youngest of five boys who grew up with their mother Stella and father Roy in the western part of the United States. He was born in Cody, Wyoming in 1912, but he and the family did not stay there long. They moved frequently in his youth, settling for periods of a time in California and Arizona, with Ray looking for work as a farmer, and Stella continually insisting on a lavish living style. As Roy worked long days on the farm, Stella raised the boys. As can be expected, they were constantly playing games and sports outside of their house. Although women were not known for their athletic prowess then, Stella surely taught her children the finer points of some of the games. As the oldest and biggest sister in her own family growing up, Stella was a bit of a tomboy. Wrote Nefe and Smith, quote, she was entitled to pitch on their Sandlot baseball games, 
and even play the pranks to herself from time to time. <coughs> this type of motherly nurturing, united with Roy's insistence that his boys be tough men. A close friend of the Pollock family, Peter Busa, said, quote, there was this emphasis on manliness. If you have boys, you have men. That was his father's philosophy. This parenting led to five children who were stronger and more athletic than most of their peers. Jay, the second oldest brother, was the star halfback on the Chico High School football team and won the school's annual boxing tournament as just a freshman. As a youngster, Jackson and another brother, Sandy, would regularly play in ball games along the Sacramento River. As the family later splintered following Roy's divorce from Stella, Jackson and another brother, Frank, retained a connection to each other through attending Jay's football games and boxing matches. Jackson himself was readily recognized for his strength and size when he was at Riverside High School. Too small to play themselves, Frank and Sandy had been counting on their big baby brother to relive the gridiron heroics of Jay. However, Jackson surprised and disappointed not only his classmates, who had assumed that any boy Jackson's size would play football, but especially his brothers. I wondered, said Frank, why a big guy like that wouldn't want to go out for football and prove his manhood. The thinking was that Jackson did not play for a combination of reasons, reasons closely associated with his personality for the rest of his life. He did not necessarily have a lack of affection for football, nor was not manly. Rather, Pollock did not want to feel the pressure of hopes others had for him. He surely acknowledged that he would have surrendered a lack of control had he decided to play. He would have been playing by someone else's rules. He would have been attempting to fill the shoes of his accomplished big brother, Jay. In addition, he relished the role of renegade. Pollock not only shied away from the team at Riverside High School, he later helped create a rebellious response brochure to the team at Manual Arts High School after he had transferred there. His behavior led to a confrontation with a group of football players who ambushed him in the hall, dragged him to a nearby bathroom, and forced his head into the toilet. Pollock later got into a fistfight with a football coach. While this sounds like it would turn Pollock off to athletes and athletics, it did not. When he moved to New York City in 1930 at the age of 18, he studied at the Art Students League under Thomas Hart Benton. Benton, who became famous for his depiction of everyday life in America, thought of art as a, quote, athletic event, a manly exercise involving structure and movement and muscle. Pollock greatly admired Benton's approach, and after a few years together, Pollock elevated himself to being Benton's class monitor. A part of the position that he paid special attention to was selecting models. Pollock focused almost exclusively on the males, and he was pretty careful about choosing them, said Joe Delaney, a classmate. His favorite models came not from the standard group that made the round of elite classes, but from the male world of bars and gyms. Despite his issues with organized sports and the people who participated in them in high school, Pollock had a great respect for athletes, particularly the competitive nature they carried with them. Said Barndo, by the time the 1940s came around, when Clement Greenberg or other critics supported him, he wasn't just going to be a painter. He was determined that he was going to be the greatest painter there was. He was going to beat Picasso. And I think he was impelled competitively to keep trying to push painting to some new zone where only he would own it. As most ambitious young people, Pollock tried to both replicate and make his own what he saw his idols doing. Said Barndo, he absorbed enormously when he got to New York. And then in 39, Picasso's Guernica arrived here. The Museum of Modern Art staged a Picasso retrospective. And then starting 1939 to 40, so many of the artists in Europe were fleeing to come to New York. So you had artists like Duchamp, Mata, Maison, all of these people involved in European surrealism arrived on the scene. And he learned a lot from that ambient. Before his drip era began, discernible figures could be recognized in Pollock's work. And as with most artists of the time, the influences on the canvas were often depictions of what he thought of as the most important aspects of his life. Having grown up in the West, Nature and Native American culture regularly were displayed in his pieces. He also incorporated concepts and ideas from his classmates and teachers at the Art Students League in New York. Beginning in 1938, Pollock underwent Jungian psychotherapy as part of treatment for his alcoholism, and soon thereafter, Jungian ideas and symbols began appearing in his artwork. All of these influences seem to have best come through in Guardians of the Secret in 1943, when Pollock gained his first measure of fame and exposure with a one-man exhibition at Peggy Guggenheim's Art of the Century Gallery. In describing the particular painting, author Elizabeth Frank said, quote, Guardians of the Secret is highly figural and highly abstract. It has two vertical figures flanking a central panel filled with hieroglyphics distributed in an all-over style. In the painting's lower register, Pollock inserted a dog, 
perhaps serving along with the vertical figures quite literally as guardians of the painter's psyche. Embodied in the central panel, a central area of roiling geometrics, the turmoil of expressionist imagery within the formality and restraint of rectilinear planes. From Jungian psychology, the painting has the concept of the symmetrical rectangle within a rectangle configuration, as well as the blatant copy of the Heda Indian tattoo pattern of a woman in the moon from Jung's symbols of transformation. Other recognizable symbols include fish, whales, wolves, and a red rooster, the latter of which Professor Bill Bergson contends is a reference to an incident in Pollock's childhood. Quote, the red kicking rooster, located at the top center of the painting, is another literal note of alarm, a solar splurge. But also, it may be the rooster that swallowed Pollock's forefinger when as a kid he lost it to an ax. An older boy chopping wood and Pollock marked a log on his finger. Anyway, Pollock was always terrified of that rooster, according to Berkson. Pollock biographer Ellen Landau believed that the Swiss painter Paul Clay also played a big role in shaping Pollock's structure for the picture. Clay died in 1940, but the Nierendorf Galleries in New York presented a series of five one-man shows of his during 1941 and 1942. Landau wrote, quote, although Clay was not destined to become one of his favorite painters, Pollock would have had ample opportunity to become familiar with this artist's style before painting Guardians of the Secret. Clay's purposely rudimentary, whimsical little stick figures, simultaneously childlike and sophisticated, possibly had some impact on the pictograms included in Guardians of the Secret. If that's the case, then there is a strong possibility that one figure in Clay's 1940 painting, Everything Comes Running After, corresponds directly with a figure in Guardians of the Secret. And if these figures reference what I believe they are meant to reference, then you might have the first uncovered representation of baseball in any of Pollock's artwork. Though Clay was a Swiss painter of German nationality, he may have become familiar with one of America's most famous sports in 1936. That summer in Berlin, baseball made a return to the Olympics after a 24-year absence. An exhibition game closed out the Olympics, and 90,000 spectators filled the Olympic Stadium to watch, making it one of the most popular events at the Games. It is not known if Clay was present or if he was as enamored by the sport as the rest of his native countrymen, but the title of his painting we are discussing, and the nature of the figure in that painting, suggests the movement of a baseball batter making contact with a pitch and completing a swing. As you all know, the game of baseball no action by any of the players occurs until after contact has been made. The everything comes running after title of the painting, and the fact that the figure on the right side of the painting is the largest, suggests that this could be a direct reference to the sport. Now compare that with this image in Pollock's Guardians of the Secret. In a way, it is a mirrored preview of Clay's batter. While Clay's figure appears to be completing the swing, to the point that the torso is fully turned and the bat is being released from his hands, Pollock's figure is on the verge of starting a motion to swing. The batter holds the bat high as the pitch approaches his midsection and the strike zone. Even if Clay did not mean for his figure to represent a baseball player, let's look at the image through the eyes of Pollock. To an American artist with a respect for sports in 1940s America, this image surely has to evoke the idea of a baseball batter. Baseball was a part of everyday culture during World War II, especially in New York City. 